Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Season 3, Episode 6 of Flippin' Bird. I am, of course, your host, Ryder, and today I'm joined by Julia Dolanetti. How are you guys doing today? Good. Be good. All right, so we have some really big UTSA basketball news to get into first off. And we're starting on the women's side, of course, with uh, the announcement of our new head coach and Karen Aston, of course, the former head coach at uh, University of Texas. And Julia, I want to get your reaction, of course, to this big hire for UTSA. I, I'm very excited as a diehard UT fan. It's going to be nice to have a Longhorn in the program. Um, I mean, honestly, I just think that we can only go up from here, not winning any conference games this season. I mean, there's, there's, there's bounds of improvement that can be made. I, I want to say that I have some high expectations, but I think that she needs to get in here and start recruiting before I can really, you know, set what I want for the season. But I mean, it's a, she's, she's, she's going to completely restart the program, I think. And, and I think that's what it needs. We can only, only go up from where we, where we are right now. Don. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I think the hire is awesome. Uh, I was doing, I, I knew, I knew of her, but I didn't know like what she had accomplished. She has a, she has a 66% win rate, which is pretty insane. Uh, she averages 22 wins a year. She's made it to the postseason 10 times out of the 13 seasons that she's coached. Uh, her farthest showing was the Elite Eight when she came in with Texas as a second seed, which is very impressive. Uh, to be fair, her 2019 season was her roughest of her career, which was 1911, which is still basically 19 games that we need to win. So I think it's very awesome to get the hire. Um, Obviously, Texas and UTSA have a very different player base, just based off the name recognition alone. So I'm curious to see what she can do with maybe a little less talent than she's used to working with. But she's also coached at multiple other schools, uh, all that are escaping me at the moment. So she she is used to it. But uh, I'm curious to see what she can do for the program. Because, I mean, again, we can only go from here. So, All right, Eddie, let's go to you. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with uh, both points Dalton and Julia said. Um, this uh, team definitely needed a new direction, and I believe this is like the the key step into doing so. And just like Dalton was saying, she is the second winningest coach in Texas history, so I believe she is going to bring a lot of experience. And like like we both said, like this team, I mean, we could only go up from here after what happened last season. So I believe this is the first step into doing so, and I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I think it's uh, kind of important to also note, I mean, she's got some really big bona fides on her. She was the Big 12 coach of the year in 2017. She has a really great reputation as a recruiter, which I think we desperately need. She signed five top 11 classes at Texas. And she actually has experience in Conference USA. Uh, Dawn, like you alluded to, she's at other stops. Uh, she coached at uh, North Texas for a uh, season. And then she was in Charlotte from 2007 to 2011. So she is intimately familiar, at least with the Conference USA landscape. So I think that this is honestly, this is higher like blue my expectations of what I thought we were probably going to get. Because let's be honest here, the program where it is right now probably isn't attractive for many candidates. So the fact that we got somebody of her caliber to come in and have that reputation as a recruiter, I think that just bodes well for the um, program. Uh, how long do you guys think this is going to take around? If I had to like, if you had to like ballpark it with somebody like her at the helm, how long do you think this might take? Because I mean, like, for example, the trailer hire, I mean, that like ignite the program instantly do we think that you know Aston can do the same thing here for the women's program or do you think she needs a couple years Julia I think it's going to take a couple seasons I mean our our football program was struggling but I don't think it was anywhere near the just in game that that we have reached um under Kristen Holt so I I think it's going to take a couple seasons because especially if we've lost Adriana Cazada and potentially Michaela Woods then we I mean we've got a couple players who can kind of lead the team but we don't really have any big name star players that are really going to step up and and be a big score and a big help for the team so I I think it's gonna take a couple seasons for sure Don. yeah uh, I think it'll take a couple seasons as well the, the the thing with trailer was what I really liked about him was that like out the gate like basically he got signed and then was immediately recruiting I think that was like a huge step in the right direction, especially for an organization where like, you know, you want to create a lot of this hype around it where it's like, yeah, we can really do something with this org. And uh, I, I think that, I think the football team also had a lot 
it was more of like internal struggles than like player base, I guess. And I feel as though that with UTSA players leaving, morale is probably at a pretty low. So I would say that I, I think it will take a couple of years, maybe maybe this season we'll see something, but I, I feel like the players that she's working with are definitely of um, are not bad, but aren't what she's used to. So I think it will take her a little bit to adjust. Eddie? Yeah, I agree with all those statements. Um, it's going to take some time just to, you know, form a new culture, just a new environment. And yeah, I would say like two to three seasons maybe because this is a total like rebuilding process. Like we need to start from the bottom up. So I would say a couple of seasons as well. Yeah, I would also say it's probably going to take her a couple of seasons, kind of like Julie and Dolan and Eddie, all of you guys are saying about that two to three season mark. Like there isn't anything that says we couldn't like come out and shock the world next year. But I mean, there's a reason why we're at where we are. I mean, you don't lose every single game in conference play by accident. Like this team needs a complete revamp, which is exciting though. Because, I mean, we got a coach of her caliber to come in, and now she can do what I thought Trailer did a great job of in year one, which is building a culture. Like, if Aston can come in for us and just build that culture, I just feel really good about the direction of the program going fun forward under her tutelage. Like, I think this is a great hire for UTSA, and it honestly makes me excited about women's basketball next season. Maybe not just for the results on the court, but what we could at least see build. And I think yeah. that's important. I, uh... I also think that UTSA women's team struggles with a lot of like the fundamentals, like just running like a simple pick and roll. And when I was at the uh, the NCAA games last night, the Texas team, uh, even though they kind of got smashed, they were actually like they run they run efficient plays, like they run a pick and roll and they run a screen and they do all these things that they're just things that you don't see from UTSA. And I think that maybe. I'm not sure how many more games we'll win with these simple fundamentals, but it should be more than what we did. So I, I think that like, you know, even getting eight points off just doing pick and rolls throughout the game, like that, that's going to be helping out tremendously in the game. So I, I think that just like the, the fundamentals that she'll bring or maybe we'll turn the season around a lot quicker than, it. but uh, yeah, until she gets a player base in there, I'm not sure. All right, so we're now going to move on to talk about UTSA baseball, who opened conference play this last weekend with a series against Rice, where they took three out of the four games and looked really good doing so. Uh, Chase Kang was an absolute monster against Rice pitching, uh, earned National Player of the Week honors from the Collegiate Baseball newspaper, including a performance in game one of the series where he hit three home runs in a single game, tying the existing UTSA record, which has been accomplished five times in program history. So, Dawn, I want to start with you. How is this team looking after that first conference slate, and where do you think this team can go with the remainder of conference play? Uh, I'm actually really impressed by what they've done. Uh, they went 3-1 and one against Rice, and uh, their previous opponent was... Uh, uh, previous opponent was... A&M Corp- Corpus. A&M yes. Corpus. Yeah, so they, I think they swept A&M Corpus, they, right, and they lost yes, to Baylor. Swept, yeah. So they had two weekends of going 3-1. Uh, like doing that after coming up playing TCU and LSU games where like you kind of got blown out in almost all, like the games didn't really seem as close. Um, and I think that they managed to bounce back really well. And I'm very impressed by that. Uh, they have super convincing wins and every loss that they have is very close. Uh, well, close is in this, the scorecard might not reflect it, but the games are a lot closer than they actually are. Um, and then they, I saw the statistic that I thought was crazy. They're outscoring their opponent 163 to 87. So when they win, they win big. And when they lose, they, they play a good game. So I think that this program has a lot that it could, I think, I think the ceiling for it is very high. Uh, I hope that they can make it there. I think the players that they have are phenomenal and they're doing great this year. So I'm really excited for UTSA baseball. Eddie? Yeah, um, just like Dalton was saying, uh, I think this team does have potential. Um, I know you mentioned uh, Chase King and uh I would have wanted the sweep. I mean, we almost did 10-8, um, but it just shows how good and resilient this team is because just like we're saying, you know, close games against Baylor and LSU, just a quick adjustments, and, you know, they can be winners of those. But I would have wanted the sweep, but a 3-1 is pretty good. And like Dalton says, they are outscoring like crazy, 11-3 to to Rice, um, and it's, they put up 16 in the first game. So I think this team does have potential going forward. Julia? Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's really interesting now that we've kind of started conference um, to see what Coach Hallmark can really do. We didn't get to see a lot of him and his coaching last season because of COVID, obviously. So 
I, I love seeing this. I love seeing how he's, you know, going to head the program and the success that we're going to have. Um, my biggest thing this week was his subtweet to uh, Conference USA. Well, I mean, he, he called them right out um, because they were talking about Chase Kang being the national player of the week. And then he tweeted, but not Conference USA hitter of the week, question mark. And I just think that I live for the Twitter drama, especially when it comes from direct quotes from coaches. So I love that. I But I mean, on a serious note, I, I really am excited to see what he can do for this program. And I mean, it's it's obviously working when you're looking at the scoring and, and what we're doing on the field. Yeah, kind of touching on the uh, Twitter thing for a second. I think it is kind of ridiculous that he's not the hitter of the week when the guy that they did name, Kang, had better stats across the board like there was I don't think there was a single metric hitting wise that he was trailing that guy they named I think it was a Louisiana Tech player I want to say I'm like, not sure. yeah but I mean just looking at this team I mean the offense is so explosive I mean up and down the lineup I mean Paxton and Rock near the top of the order and then Ian, Ian Bailey the uh, transfer from Grambling State this year is just coming and swung a big stick like he just he doesn't always hit the ball, like, but when he does, it goes a ways. So, like, this and team just Thornquist. has power. Yeah, Thornquist is on fire last season. Like, he, because, I mean, I think he was uh, on the All-Conference USA team before last season started. And then he kind of got off to a slow start last season. I think we almost all kind of forgot about how good Thornquist is because he is on fire to start this season. Like, he's, he's second on the team in our batting average. I know he's second on the team in home runs. Like, he, he's doing a good job driving the offense out of that cleanup spot. So, again, though, it's the one the one thing about this team is always going to be the bullpen. You know, we were up by four hanging in the last inning of game two there, and then we blew that lead because we just couldn't find that last out. So, the bullpen, I think, continues to be the main question mark of this team. But I will say the starting pitching, I think, is really solidified. I feel like with Dowdy and Malone at the top, and then Simon Miller has come in the freshman and in the two starts he's been given he's been absolutely fantastic he took a no hitter into the uh sixth inning of game four or game three i believe so like he's off to a really good start so i'm very like happy to see this team perform in conference because i think it can be really easy to like go oh we're blowing out AM corpus christi we're blowing out you know ut arlington despite the fact that ut arlington is really good in the conference they're in but like to be able to kind of do the same thing against conference usa opposition i think is so key for this team and really makes me feel really good about our chances in conference because you never know until you like start to play okay. all right so we're going to talk about utsa soccer now of course they've been kind of struggling this season and uh, over the past week, they again suffered two postponements, which has kind of continued a trend this season for uh, COVID complications, usually in the programs we're facing, kind of derailing us. So, don't, Eddie, I want to start with you. How much are these postponements and camp- cancellations really hurting this team right now? Uh, it definitely, like, affects a groove. I mean, if we even had one, I know the last game we played was against uh, was it UAB. And yes. I mean, it was a close one uh, off a of penalty kick. So I think that game was, I mean, you can't really take much from that game since it was off a of penalty kick, but you could see some improvement there. And then who knows, maybe the next game could give them like some consistency going with that. But with these games canceled, it kind of, you know, destroys any type of groove to get it going. So I think it's affecting them pretty bad, but. I mean, only time will tell. Julia? Yeah, I agree. I mean, we've lost, let's see, four out of the last five games that we've played, so they haven't really been able to find a momentum this season after cancellations at the beginning of the season and then postponements, and now we have cancellations here. So I think it's it's really going to be hit or miss with them. Let's, I mean, there's, let's see, now there's, one game left before the conference tournament and if I mean even if we are able to play that so I'm not really sure I mean we it's it's kind of up in the air they haven't been doing too hot this season they've only won two games but I mean they just haven't been able to find their groove with everything that's going on scheduling wise Don yeah um I mean finding your groove is super important 
you, you like a team that, that's like the biggest thing in like terms like when you think about um when you think about like baseball right like postseason baseball if a team gets hot they might not have the best players but they'll win they'll just win the entire thing and I, and I think that can be like even though that doesn't apply to every sport I think that applies to most especially in college level like collegiate level like look at UCLA for example like they might have had a tough regular season but they're already away and like they're already in the final four so I mean a team can build a momentum and get somewhere very quickly uh I think UTSA having two losses against Southern Miss and UAB and then getting a game like they, they probably really wanted this game to like because you want to start off on a win you want you want to build up this momentum and if you have one win going into conference uh the playoffs I mean it's like it's not it's not nearly as good as getting two so I think that uh this team's also been struggling a lot with offense so I I think that they really want to try to get, get that clicking because they're taking seven shots to the to the, their opponent's 11 which is just like I mean you can't do that if you want to win games so um yeah, I think that there's a lot that they need to improve, and I think that that can really only come with game time, and they're just not getting it. So, yeah, I think that it's almost unfair to like say that this has been a really poor season for them because they really haven't gotten a chance to string any amount of games together. Like there was maybe a portion of the season, like right in the middle, where they got like six games in a row. But other than that, it's been a lot of stop, start, stop start cancellation COVID postponements and I mean this team's biggest issue has just always been goal scoring this season and it can be really hard to find that rhythm and groove if you're constantly having a game postponed or canceled like 24 hours before you're actually supposed to play it I mean like watching most of these games I mean most of our shots are like inches away from finding the back of the net I mean it's a goalie's fingertip it's a post it's just skimming outside like we're so close and I feel like if we just had those more consistent games we could be finding the back of the net more often and that'd be leading to more wins. But right now it's just, it's almost too much to ask to be in a rhythm when you're being just completely taken out every two or three matches. Like it's just, it's a hard ask. All right. So moving on to a team that of course, you know, doesn't maybe get a lot of love around here, but is having a very solid season. Uh, UTSA men's tennis, of course, is uh, one and one last week against a nationally ranked South Florida team before they swept Lamar. So, Julie, I want to start with you. What did you think of UTSA men's tennis so far, and how are we looking heading into the conference tournament now? I am actually very optimistic about this team. We're 11 and six on the season, which, I mean, I don't give as much love to tennis as I probably should, just because I don't know a whole lot about it. But I mean, watching them and reading what they're doing, I, I'm very optimistic going into the conference tournament. We played some, some big opponents this year and haven't lost by much. I mean, we played Oklahoma, OU and only lost by like one. So I think that our level of competition right now has, has really prepared us for the tournament. And I think we could, we have the potential to go far. Don't. Yeah, uh, they're very good. I mean, I think obviously like seeing UTSA playing against ranked opponents and losing is something that, you know, you wish wasn't happening. Uh, but I mean, the game, the way that they're losing isn't, they're not getting blown out. They're not getting demolished. So, I mean, they're, they're destroying teams that are like around their level of play. So I think that it's, it's safe to say that UTSA men's tennis falls underneath ranked opponents, but right, right, uh, like definitely a, like getting to that level almost. I would say that they're definitely better than the average opponent. Because I mean, like when you look at most of the games, like against Lamar sweep, U, uh, UIW sweep, I mean, Texas A&M Corpus Christi 4-1. It's just like, it seems like they just beat every opponent who is a nationally ranked. So I'm really excited for conference play because um, I think that they're probably the best team coming into it. I think we'll be really be able to determine that when they play Rice. That will just give us a, an example of what it looks like in conference play, which is really important because you don't know how you'll play against everybody. But I mean, like, if you think what UIW was, it's, it looks pretty good. Eddie? Um, I was, I'm surprised nobody brought up that uh, Rec Row actually snapped his 11 game winning. <laughs> I know. Yeah, he was looking so good. And then he ran up against uh, the 45th player ranked in singles in the country, I believe. Yeah. And like, that's actually all I wanted to talk about because I know last week or I think it was last week where we were like, if we can bet on someone to win, it'd be Rec Row. And then, damn, the 11 game winning streak snap. That was our mistake. We shouldn't have brought it up. Yep. We definitely jinx. But yeah, I agree with, with both of y'all. Um, I definitely believe in conference play. 
I think will be the best team going in. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's a fair assumption to make. I mean, and we played us uh, South Florida really close. I mean, South Florida was the 29th team in the nation in that match. And we only lost five two. like a uh, Jao Siolan again, had a really good match. He actually knocked off the 69th player in the world or in the country. Sorry, getting, getting ahead of myself with the whole international thing. It's how I usually think about tennis. Um, but yeah, you'd be the 69th player in the country in a three set game. Wreck out, even though he lost, he took the 45th best player to three sets and lost in a 10 7 tiebreaker. Like, again, we are playing really good tennis right now. And I still feel like this team, agreeing with you guys, I think we're probably one of the better teams in the conference. And conference tournament, we have a really good shot at winning it. So now, Heading over to the women's side of the court, um, they dropped only their lone game against North Texas this week after their game against Corpus Christi was postponed. And uh, kind of contrary to what they usually have uh, happened during their matches, they struggled at doubles play where they've really been their best all season, eventually dropping the match three to four. Don, how did women's tennis look this week? And where do you think we're headed? I mean, yeah, doubles is uh, something that I feel like EPSA has done pretty well in. Uh, not the greatest, but to lose and it's it's whatever i feel like they're they're winning a lot of they're winning a lot of good games but i think this is one of those examples where i wish that we could see wins against conference uh teams like for example against florida atlantic i mean going 04 is like if you sandwich that in between like the the youngston town state game and then the unlv game it's just like it feels really bad because you want to see them win that game above everything else so i think that this team is not quite on the level of the men's team, but I think that they have a lot, like, I think that their, their ceiling is a lot higher than they're showing right now. Uh, Cause like what, sometimes what they do to these teams is like insane. And then when they play against a team that even slightly matches them, they seem to just lose all of that confidence. So I think this is, I think that they're, they definitely can make some noise, but I, I, for now I'm a little hesitant to bet on them. Eddie. Yeah. Um, just like Dalton was saying, once they play a pretty, good team. I mean, they tend to crumble. I mean, just like Houston and Texas. Um, but at least they got a chance with these next two games. Um, I mean, I know the Corpus game was postponed, correct? Correct. Correct. Um, so hopefully they play Texas State and UT Arlington. I feel like those are very winnable games. And maybe to get them a little bit of momentum and groove before April 22nd. Um, yeah. Julia? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I was a little bit shocked as well on our on our doubles performance, but hopefully that they can find some some common ground and some matching of ability with our next two two matches before we go into conference. But I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have a lot to say about about the women's team. Yeah, I think overall, it was just kind of really surprising me to see them struggle in doubles because that's just where we've been really consistent, like Dolan's been saying, all year long. And it just seemed like for whatever reason, against this match against North Texas, we just couldn't ever really find it. Uh, I do want to give a special shout-out, though, to Alexander Weir. She was probably our best player last week against North Texas. She was just really solid, and as a freshman, I think that she's got a long, nice career as a road runner ahead of her. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what I have. Like, I'm looking forward to seeing what she does going forward. So now we're going to move over to uh, women's golf, of course. They finished out uh, in the Bruzzy, love that name, um, finishing ninth out of 16th in front of a nationally ranked TCU side in 10th place and a 16th ranked Miami in 12th. Uh, they left a really strong last eight shards. They put up the second best round on the final day of the competition, and they surged up the leaderboards led by Anna Gonzalez's strong finish to the tournament. So, Don, I want to start with you. How women's golf look this weekend? And where are we looking heading closer towards the end of the season? I think that women's golf, like this tournament, if you just segmented it, if you just look at everything except the final day, you would be like, this is these guys, like they are not playing to the level that they used to. But when you look at that final day, having, having Anna Gonzalez shoot four under par and surging up four, they went up four ranks on the final day, thanks to the help of everybody, of course. But Anna Gonzalez being the leader for the UTSA women's team, I think that. When you see that, it's kind of insane to think that uh, just in one day they went up so far. So I think 
that if they can have more performances and be more consistent with things like that, then they, I think they could have ranked even higher in the tournament. But they just they really struggled for the first days. So I think that this team can do a lot, and I'm really excited. Again, I think Anna Gonzalez is. I am surprised that I feel like she should be like on a, like a nationally ranked team with top five. Like she she is putting up insane numbers every time. So I'm really impressed with what they've been doing, and I'm I'm really happy about it. Eddie. Yeah, I was gonna talk about Anna Gonzalez as well. And was this the uh, was this the last game? Uh, was it the last tournament of the yeah, season? The the last. Okay, uh, yeah. well there you they go. Their conference USA Yeah, and will they be competing in? They should be. Yeah, they should be. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you said ninth out of sixteen. Ninth out of sixteen in a pretty stacked field. Uh, they finished behind a. <laughs> Finished behind five, six, six ranked teams in the top 50. So, yeah, I, b- I believe uh, this team is pretty good. Like you said, maybe this is a maybe this is a golf uh, college. Um, but. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll see how it goes in the next. Julia. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I agree with both of y'all. I think that we have been a little bit inconsistent this season, but I do have hope for the conference tournament only because in the tournaments that we've played kind of our caliber or like level of teams, we've done fairly well. I mean, we got second in our own tournament only behind tech. So I have some confidence. Um, I also think that Cameron Carrion, I don't know how to say her last name. I mean, her and Anna Gonzalez to me kind of carry the team a little bit which is kind of concerning because Anna's a senior but I mean I think that we just need to get more consistent in our playing it's it's a little bit concerning that we're playing really bad for two rounds of a tournament and then the third round we're carried by one person so I think that that needs a little bit of work but I think that in the conference tournament when we're playing our level of competition, I, I have high hopes for us. Yeah, kind of speaking to your, inc- you know, you bring it up inconsistency. I look at it and we are a bit of a slow starting team. I feel like our consistency is our inconsistency at times mm-hmm. in that we will usually have like one round a tournament where we're really good and the other rounds we can be a little uneven. Just usually depends on which round that is. I feel like overall, historically, our last round is usually our best round. And I honestly look at ninth out of 16th as a win. It was a bit of a stacked field for us. And we had a really uneven like performance, like Anna Gonzalez with that big round finished tied for four, tied for 18th. But then you have to go all the way down to tied for 40th with the uh, Kedia Mixon for uh, our next highest finisher. And then carry on Hannah Holzman, Polvacek, those people like they're all the way down in like the 40 to 50 range, which is really like, uncharacteristic for them usually we tend to live more with them in like the 30s to 20s and in Holzman's case at least she had a couple of top 10 finishes earlier in the season so I look at ninth at 16th when we had basically four of our golfers having a bit of an off tournament that's not bad honestly so I would say that this team is like you guys are saying when we're up against our own level of competition we've looked really good and when we're up against you know six teams in the top 50 of course we're going to be a little further down the line but i do like that we did finish ahead of at least two of the teams i mean we miami 16th i mean like that's pretty good to be the 16th team no matter how you know rough of a tournament they had they're still 16th so like i feel pretty good about this team and i don't know i'm excited for the conference tournament i think it's going to be a really fun event to see how we do it Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and of course our uh, last thing for utsa sports this week uh utsa track and field was over for the Texas Relays, correct? That's the, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the uh, outdoor season is starting off pretty well for us. We secured six podium finishes, uh, punctuated, of course, by Bashir Abdullahi's win in the 110-meter hurdles. And Faith Roberson set a, a UTSA record with a bronze medal finish in the 400 with a uh, final time of, Julia, do you have the time in front of you? Hold on. I can pull it up real quick. For for Faith's uh, yes, let's see. What was it? Uh, yes, uh, fifty-seven seconds. Well, fifty-seven point fifty-four. 
So Very cool. yeah. And she actually was the, she raced the fastest time ever recorded by a UTSA track athlete in the 400 hurdles. So she's, she's up there. And she also is the conference USA female track athlete of the week. Hey, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't it Alana Yukich that she, uh, I think yeah, she, the she eclipsed. Yeah, she had said it like, like I think the week before that, and then Faith broke it like right after. Yeah, I yeah. think overall this team is performing really strongly. Like, I mean, our it, it seems like every week we almost kind of like trade off which side is the more dominant side. If it's if, it, if it's our track or our field. Like I know last week at our home meet and everything, the field events were really good for us. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like the next week after that here and at the uh, Texas relays, it's the track athletes are really picking it up. So uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag so far in terms of like our consistent results. But I mean, looking at a uh, Grunwald and, you know, Abdullahi, we do have some pretty consistent podium finishers on the team. So I feel like we're off to a really good start. And of course we haven't seen our uh, hapt athletes in a little while. So uh, look out for them to come back in action pretty soon. Cause man, we got a good heptathlon slash decathlon team. Yeah, and especially considering the level of competition that we're competing against, especially at the Texas Relays and then coming up at a and and even at our home meet, it's insane. I mean, these are the top track per- programs in the country. So the fact that we're able to pull some podium finishes is very impressive. Eddie, do you have any further thoughts on track and field? Uh, I do not, uh, other than I think we're off to a pretty good start. Um, we'll see how the couple next meets come and – I think we could determine what kind of team we are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we also finished third, both teams finished third in the conference indoor championships. So, I mean, I think that kind of is a really good indicator of where we're going to be in the outdoor, hopefully. Hopefully. I I mean, obviously some of the events are a little different, but I mean, it's just moving outside, right? Right again. Is it? (laughs) I mean, obviously not. There's a lot more that goes behind it, but still, yeah. pretty good indicator we're probably going to be come uh, end of the season. Right. There. All right, so now, we're, of course, we're going to move on to match, Mar- match madness, March madness, our uh, favorite time of the year, at least one of my favorite times of the year. And uh, we've reached it. We've reached the end. We've reached the final four. Uh, obviously, we kind of established last week all of our brackets are burned to a crisp Um or, you know, looks like a bloody massacre occurred in my case with all the red ink I've been having to write in. But overall, what do you guys think so far of the tournament? Uh, Julia, I want to start with you. Men's and women's sides. Okay. Um, I have not been up to date on the men's tournament, believe it or not. That's probably like the most bad tasting sentence that's ever come out of my mouth. Um, because I've been working every day of the women's tournament. So... I can speak more for the women's side of things. Shocking. Again, can't believe it. Um, I'm not surprised that these teams are here. Um, Working the the first and second rounds, I kind of picked out that it would be, you know, Stanford and South Carolina and like every, you know, I've, I've watched all of them play and that's not shocking to me. I have my money on Stanford. So, so I'm hoping, I mean, not real money, but, I'm hoping that they're they're going to pull it off. I think they've got a great team. They played – I mean, they came back last night. I think it was like a 14-point deficit and ended up winning in the fourth quarter by by 14 points. So they've got an impressive team. Um, yeah, but, but looking at everybody's performance coming into the tournament, I'm not surprised that these final four are here. Yeah. Don, let's go to you. Uh, yeah, I've also been working a lot of the women, so I haven't gotten to watch a ton of men's, uh, live at least, but I've been, I've been catching up on it. Uh, and earlier today, before we even hopped on, I was watching the Gonzaga game and there was really no point because they seem to just be smashing everybody. Uh, I know, isn't it some crazy number, like 73% of people have predicted Gonzaga to win. Uh, and I mean, it's evident why, like they just seem like just a more complete team than everybody else. They're elevating on a higher level. Uh, I saw this tweet where it was like, uh, are you taking Gonzaga right now? Or like the 73 bowls. And I was like, yeah, 73 and 10 win bowls. I'm like, that's a, that's a good guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the only really exciting game I would say that's coming up is the Baylor Houston match. I think Houston has not played a single digit ranked opponent. 
which is kind of insane. And I feel like the 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 road for their final four is I didn't say that it, like I don't know how to say it, that everyone else had to play a much more difficult schedule than them. Statistically, um, Houston has had the easiest road to the final four of all yeah. time. Yeah, it's it's pretty insane. Uh, and I mean, even the games are kind of close in a sense. So it, it's kind of scary. Maybe they're not as good as people think they are. Um, Baylor has shown up to play. I'm really impressed by them. I think that they, they, they've definitely impressed me. They've played in close games and they still won. Uh, UCLA is obviously the biggest upset. Uh, coming in as an 11 seed. Um, I mean, they've, they've been good. I mean, they played a close game against Michigan, even though Michigan star player got injured. I think it was their point guard. He Isaiah back. Livers. Yeah, as a, he came back for uh, the 32nd or the second round, um, but he's still not 100%. So, you know, you, you can't really hold it against him. Um, and then, I mean, they dominated Alabama, which is something that, you know, you don't, you don't often see. So uh, I think UCLA is definitely a team to watch out for, but they're going against Gonzaga. So I would kind of already count them out. Uh, on the women's side of it, uh, yeah, the game we were watching last night, um, I will say women – Women's game are a lot more chalk and they're kind of, I feel like a lot of them are determined in the first half. Uh, but that cannot be said for the Stanford game. I was, I had completely written Stanford off. I was like, Oh, well, just a small upset, whatever. But then um, Julia, do you remember the name of player 23? Uh, uh, Kiana Williams. Yeah. Kiana Williams. Uh, she legit pulled up from the logo uh, twice. Yeah. And twice. I was like, I was like, I was like the first time she made it. I was like, I was like, that was the luckiest shot. And that's swung the momentum so hard. And then she did it like even farther back. And I was like, what? So I was, I was very, very impressed by the way that they rallied back. Uh, you know, Russell Wilson was also very impressed. I was watching him the entire time. Um, his sister plays for Stanford. So I was very excited to see him. Um, yeah, the UConn Baylor game was a little weird because that play was definitely question marks. Uh, Texas got crushed. Arizona and Indiana was close if you didn't look at the score. But that's basically my my recap of the NCAA. Eddie, how about you? Uh, the two picks that I had on both sides, women and men's, are still there. Uh, born picks, UConn and Gonzaga. But, um, yeah, I think UConn's been, you know, steamrolling, and so is Gonzaga. And I still have both of them to win it all. Um, yeah, I, I think Michigan with a healthy um, – I know we're talking about Isaiah Livers – they could have maybe nicked over them and gotten over UCLA, but I still have UConn and uh, Gonzaga winning it all. All right, so let's get into some hardcore predictions here. So, of course, we got Gonzaga and why did my Gonzaga and UCLA, and on the other side, of course, we got Baylor and Houston. So, Don, I want to start with you. Who do you got winning that game? Uh, Gonzaga and Baylor for sure. I mean, I, I feel like Houston just – they haven't really played an opponent that I can say, like – the games they play are close, and don't get me wrong, I, I think that Syracuse was very good, and then they played uh, Oklahoma State, who I also thought was very good. Um, they were definitely, like, a sleeper pick, but, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like a lot of these teams, like, uh, the road for Baylor was a lot harder than for Houston, and I, and I think that that will definitely be showing, like, in their level of play. And then Gonzaga versus UCLA – don't get me wrong. I think if UCLA wins, that would be crazy. Like I would love to see something like that, but I just, I, I mean, for my bracket purely, it's not going to happen. There's no way. I feel like Gonzaga has just been too dominant against every opponent they've played. And even though UCLA has upset a lot of teams, it's just, I just don't think that they can make it. All right. Hey, we know you're going with the Gonzaga, but where are you going with the Baylor Houston matchup? Baylor Houston matchup. Uh, I think I agree with Dalton. I think I'm going to go Baylor. Um, Exactly for the same points he said. Uh, I believe they beat Oregon State. Was it the last game? So, I mean, he's he's right. I mean, they've been playing, you know, low tier teams. So I believe they run into like a pretty good force in Baylor, and I think they finally meet their match. Julia. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's going to be Gonzaga and Baylor. In the end, um, yeah. I mean, just based on what y'all are saying, that Houston has had the easiest road here I mean I I'm not a Baylor or Houston fan so I don't really have any strong feelings about it but I definitely think Baylor's gonna gonna take it and then I mean it would be an interesting game to watch UCLA kind of dethrone Gonzaga but I just don't think it's gonna happen they're on a they're on such a hot roll right now that it's kind of hard to 
to overcome that as an underdog team. Historically, this is where you usually see the double digit seeds glass slipper finally break. Like if they manage to get through the gauntlet all the way through the elite eight to the final four, it seems like the national semifinals is always a rather kind of Peter out. So even though I'm scared to like UCLA scares the crap out of me as somebody that's picking Gonzaga to win it all, like, cause they are hot. I mean, Gonzaga just looks almost unbeatable. I mean, like, if you watch that game against USC, I mean, like, everybody in the national media, all the way up to leading up to that game is, UCLA is going to give them problems. You know, watch out for Evan Mobley, et cetera. And sure, Evan Mobley got 18 or something like that. But, I mean, UC- USC was down by 15 by the 10-minute mark the first half. I mean, like, Gonzaga just rolled over them. So, I think they're just going to completely trounce UCLA. Now, on the other side of the bracket, I'm kind of with you guys. I feel like Houston hasn't been tested. So it's kind of hard to say that, yeah, I think they'll give Baylor a really good game. On the other hand, though, Houston was a two seed for a reason. Like, it's not that they're a weak team that has benefited from an easy schedule. Like, they're a good team that's gotten to play a bunch of easier opponents. So I think that's the interesting, like, factor in this is that we haven't really seen Houston, like, really get tested by a top-tier team yet. So I think it's going to be a close game, but I'm taking Baylor just purely because – they're so good on the perimeter. And if they get hot, like we saw during the game against Arkansas, it can be really hard to come, come back and catch up on them. Even though Arkansas did to their credit, Arkansas kind of closed the gap down, but then they couldn't make a shot towards the end of the game because Baylor tied the defense up on them. And so I think that it's going to be Baylor Gonzaga. And then I'm still taking the Zags. I think that they're just the team of destiny this year. So what about on the women's side? Of course, we have Arizona taking on South Carolina or Arizona taking on UConn. And then on the other side, we have South Carolina and Stanford. Julie, I want to start with you. Um, I think it's going to be UConn and Stanford in the finals uh, 100% just based on watching them play. Um, I mean, I, I feel like South Carolina had it a little bit easy playing Texas last night. I mean, they absolutely massacred them. And I think this is really going to be their, their testament game. If they can upset Stanford, I would be shocked. But I mean, I also wasn't that impressed watching UConn. Who who were they playing? I forget. Baylor. Oh, Baylor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I was shocked that the score was that close. I mean, Baylor has a historically good program, but I just, I mean, based on previous years, I did not think that anybody was going to come close to them and. So now my faith in UConn isn't as strong as it was at the beginning. I had them pick to win it all, but now I'm leaning towards Stanford. So I don't know. Stanford's hot right now. That that comeback game is, is going to fuel them, I think, to make it all the way. Eddie? Um, I still got UConn winning it all. Um, I just think that they kind of put took their foot off the gas with Baylor because I feel like they were just steamrolling everybody and Maybe they thought that this was going to be the same. And I think it caught them by surprise. And before they wanted to put their foot back on, you know, it's, you know, they were in a fight. So I got UConn still winning it all. On the other side, I think the South Carolina Stanford, I know y'all are picking Stanford. Um, I think it's going to be a closer, grittier game than we think. But I still think Stanford's going to win. And I think we'll see the same thing Stanford and UConn. Don't. That's a. I, I agree with everybody's points, but I watching the games last night, it, it felt like I, I know that Texas was a six seed, but they do have Charlie uh, Charlie Collier, who is the number one projected pick to go to the. She's supposed to be pick number one against or the WNBA, and I mean she didn't necessarily show out, but that's because she was shut down in the paint every single time she had an option to. And uh, I don't know the South Carolina game, like they just seemed so dominant comparative to when you watch the Stanford game against it was Cardinal versus Cardinals, which I learned last night. Uh, it, it just, it, they had to come back from an 18 point deficit to win. And granted they blew them out, but I mean, hypothetically, if they don't make all those plays early on, that just, I mean, they went on like a, I think it was like a five possession score run where it just like, they couldn't get touched. And it was, I don't think that's going to happen against these higher ranked opponents, even though don't get me wrong, the Cardinals are good, but Louisville definitely threw that one pretty hard. And I, and I think that they could have punched their ticket really easily if they just played stronger defense. So I'm going to take <sighs> for Stanford versus – it's Stanford, Arizona, right? Uh, yeah. Stanford, South Carolina. 
counter the Stanford, South Carolina. I'm going to take South Carolina, and then I'm going to take UConn in the Arizona game. Uh, even though I think Arizona played a lot better than UConn, and UConn could have very easily lost off of a penalty or, or a foul. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like UConn does have the program history to back it up, so I, I can definitely go for them. But at the end of the day, I think I'm going to take South Carolina winning it all after watching the Texas game. I was very, very impressed by it. All right. I personally, I'm going to stick with what I've been saying since the beginning when I kind of posed to you guys at the beginning of like a couple weeks ago. I think it's Stanford and UConn in the finals. I just think that Stanford, even though they kind of got behind there and had to pull off the miracle comeback against Louisville, I still think pound for pound Stanford is probably, if not the best team, the second best team, I think it's really close with UConn personally. So I think that Stanford will be able to handle South Carolina and get them on out of there. And then I think on the other side, UConn got, a pretty favorable draw. I mean, they don't have to deal with the uh, NC state on their side of the bracket. They only have to deal with Arizona. Like again, Arizona, a great run, but I think again, women's basketball, a little more chalky. I mean, Baylor was a really good team. I mean, yeah, they were two C, but they were almost kind of like for me, a one like E or one F sort of thing. Like it was a pretty, I thought they were probably deserving a one seed in most other years. So I think that overall UConn and Stanford, I'm still sticking with UConn. I mean, just because of Paige Buckets, I think that she is the most electrifying player in college basketball. I can't wait to see her in a couple of years in the WNBA. But I think that it's going to be a really good game. And I think, honestly, just go watch it. Like, it is good basketball. Now, of course, Don, you were kind of alluding to it, though. Uh, we got to talk about that Baylor-UConn ending. Uh, what did you think of that uh, call or, well, rather lack of a call at the end of the game? Uh, watching it live was... I don't know. I had really good seats for it. I was, I was, I was right behind the, the basket and I was watching like directly and it definitely looked like a foul to me. And I was surprised I didn't call it. Um, but I mean, I I've always been one to say that I think in the final couple of minutes of a game or the final couple of seconds of the game, like the refs just need to swallow their whistle. I feel like that's something that, uh, I don't know, especially when it comes to like playing for their final four, like this is an elite eight game where it's coming down to the wire. I feel like you can't call, a foul to end the game and granted I do think it was a foul but I just I just felt like the the situation they put themselves in was was a bit unfortunate because they they weren't really producing uh later into the game for Baylor but yeah I think I think it was a definite foul but I I kind of agree with the refs and not calling it right away because it was from the, from where the ref, ref was standing until they do into the replay it did seem a little little maybe something because her hand did touch the ball before it touched her face but it definitely kind of swatted her in the face pretty hard. So, Julia, we'll go to you. Uh, I agree. I mean, watching the like the whole game, and I don't, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where like she deserved it, in my opinion. I mean, she was fouling the the Baylor girl was fouling the crap out of everyone, like just blatant like charges it was insane so I think maybe that might have played a little bit into it where it was like okay sister like <laughs> I mean you've been playing some nasty ball which like I've I haven't seen basketball played like that in a long time um I mean Baylor was a very very physical team but I think that factoring into the stakes of the game I mean I don't know. It was a foul, but I'm not sure exactly if it was should have been called just because of the level of physical, physicality at that game. Like the entire game looked like that. So there were definitely calls that could have been traded from both sides that weren't. But I'm not sure. I mean, when it comes down to the wire, it could go either way. I mean, I don't know. I, I saw a lot of stuff. I mean, where everyone's like, I mean, you can't, I mean, that's the program. You know, their championship program maybe that played a little bit into it. But, I mean, she definitely got fouled. But in my opinion, she deserved it. So, I don't know. Eddie? Uh, I mean, I don't like to talk too much on, like, you know, things that just can't be undone. You know, like, once once, once these things happen, it's, it's kind of like you, you got to move on because you can't, you can't do anything about it anymore. They're not going to be like, oh, let's, you know, let's go back put the time back and then we'll put the exact score and then we'll play it out. Like you can't do that. Like, that's why I don't like touching these things because I've seen it in every sport. I mean, you've had it with your Rams and the saints on that. Like <laughs> you can't like ever the push off on Kyle Rudolph against the saints, like Minnesota Vikings, like you just, 
you you need to make it you need to like literally like just make it on call because if not i mean you can't go back and the thing is that y'all were saying is she definitely got fouled or i mean it's up to the ref you know she wants to disappoint you know one part of the fan base or you know it's 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 tough but it already happened uconn's here so we can't go back and that's all i gotta say about it yeah yeah, I know that me personally, that was a foul. Like, to the letter of the law, it was probably, like, that's a pretty, like, blame. I mean, she got mugged. That's the best way I could put it. Going to your point about, you know, letting the refs swallow their whistles, for the most part, I will agree with you, unless it's so blatant that you just can't let it go. And to me, that play just kind of, I mean, she got hit in the face. She got hit in the arm. She, you know, she got swarmed by two defenders. Like, to me, there was almost no way that you couldn't call it like i'm usually with you on that like final seconds of the game just let him go at it but i mean if it's so blatant like say we're in nfl playoff game and a corner just tackles a wide receiver in the end zone so he doesn't catch it i mean like you gotta fl- throw a flag on that right so that's kind of like where the play was for me it was like it was so blatant you have to call it especially because it was only they were down by two at the time she makes both free throws it's still a tie game like that wasn't a game winning call that was just a game losing call if you're baylor fair yeah, it's tough. It's really tough when it comes to those things because you can't, you can't go back on it. the The only thing we've seen is like refs say, "I apologize, I missed that call." But like, what does that do? Like, we're out of the tournament. Like, it's not going to help us get back in the tournament, you know. So it's, it's tough. Challenge flag. That's what we need. Yeah, throwing the red flag. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that will never happen though. But if yeah. it did, it probably would have saved. I don't know if yeah. Baylor still wins that game, but you know, you playing for OT instead of losing is definitely better. So yeah. Now moving on from the college scene into the professional realm, uh, the NBA had its trade deadline last week, and Eddie, I wanted to get your thoughts overall and what you thought of all the moves teams were making out there. Uh, the Nets are just ridiculous. Um, I'm glad we got uh, Andre Drummond, um, but that wasn't really a trade; it was more of a buyout, right? Um, I mean. I think teams are just, or athletes are now realizing since LeBron and the Celtics, you know, Ray Allen, KG, Paul Pierce, and then LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and uh, Chris Bosh. I think since 2010, people are realizing if you're not with LeBron James or you're not with Kevin Durant now, it's like you're not going to win a ring. So that's why everybody, and honestly, since 2010, I don't think, well, when LeBron got hurt with the Lakers, there hasn't been a finals without LeBron. So I think athletes are starting to like realize that, hey, if I'm not playing with LeBron or now it's Kevin Durant, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, that I'm not going to win a ring. So that's why you saw, I mean, Blake Griffin go, um, LaMarcus Aldridge go. Um, So to the Nets, So my thoughts on the trade deadline are just, I don't know. It's not even like a, uh, like a contest anymore. Like we know who's going to go to the finals. So those are my thoughts on the trade deadline. Don, let's go to you. And especially uh, concerning the Spurs and their kind of lack of movement to say the least. Yeah. um, Just to touch on what Eddie was saying. I mean, the league kind of changed to just the rich get richer it seems i mean when you, when you think about the nets lineup that's not a real lineup that's not real like you, you can't you can't have that you can't have blake griffin lamarcus aldridge kd kyrie irving and james harden like at one point all of them were like close to mvp candidates i mean maybe yeah. not lamarcus and blake griffin but for the most part it's just like it doesn't make sense you you would win your fantasy basketball with league with that lineup like two oh, years ago yeah yeah, yeah oh, for yeah. sure and i mean i, I feel like this is just like it's been like one of those things where it seems almost like um, just like they just want to get a ring. They just want to cash out. And I, I, I kind of hate that in terms of basketball. Cause I've, I've always liked being excited, like watching one or two players on every team. But when you look at the nets, it's just like, it, it seems like you're playing a 2k game. It doesn't seem like it's really like happening. So I, I'm a little disappointed by what the league has kind of turned into. Uh, yeah. The nets are just overbearing. I think the drum and pick is actually huge for the Lakers. Uh, it is. I, I, I think Drummond, I've, I've been, like, saying that Drummond's been pretty insane. I mean, he's had performances where he does, like, zero points and has, like, 29 rebounds. I'm just like, Jesus. Uh, but, so, he's pretty insane. Um, 
both defensively, which is something that the Lakers have kind of been struggling with, especially like getting second chance points off rebounds. It's pretty big playing in a conference where what I kind of want to talk about was like the nuggets are just like insanely large at this point. It's, it's kind of insane. So you need somebody like Drummond to go up there for it. Uh, but yeah, touching on the Spurs, I mean, this was our first trade since 2014 for a player who will be in the G league. So awesome. Uh, I, I kind of touched about it in my Spurs article where I said that letting players contracts expire is the worst thing you can do for an organization. It, like, why are you letting Rudy Gay, DeMar DeRozan, and LaMarcus Aldridge all get out of their contract for free when you could trade them for assets? And, I mean, the Spurs do a great job of refining, like, young talent. So, I mean, I, I'm sure, like, if you traded DeMar to half the teams in the league, they would give you something that you could turn into, like, a Derek White, where people might not know his name, but he's dropping 22 points every night. So, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty disappointed, especially because I felt like this year was, like, the year they needed to make a trade, and they made none. So, all right, Julia. Sorry, I don't know what they're doing outside. I'm like, guys, trying to film a podcast. Please be quiet. Um, like I said earlier, I've I've been super consumed with the women's tournament, so I haven't been paying a lot of attention to anything else, really. Um, I will say that I'm sad to see LaMarcus Aldridge leave the Spurs. I love him. Um, but, I mean, other than that, yeah, I, I mean, I – I agree with what y'all are saying. I don't have a whole lot to say about that, but I think Aldridge will be missed. Um, we're hanging on to, to Patty Mills, and then that's all that I really care about <laughs> for the Spurs. So, yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, at least for me personally, I thought the trade deadline was kind of like a, the usual NBA trade deadline. Like, there's one big move where, like, a name like Aaron Gordon – gets moved but other than that it was a lot of like role players and stuff and even Aaron Gordon could be considered a role player but he at least has some name brand recognition going on I think he's actually going to do a lot of good work for the Nuggets I don't think that that puts them above the Lakers but I think it makes them probably they were our kind of third best team I thought behind the Lakers and the Clippers but I'm pretty sure that kind of just moves them in there uh shout out to Lou Williams getting to go home to Atlanta so where he could just go get his lemon pepper wings all every other day like good for him and good that he you know wanted to actually play there and say you know retiring like he said he was considering to because i think that the league is a worse place without lou williams in it so that's kind of my thoughts on the trade deadline um kind of like you guys are saying alluding to with like the lower marcus aldridge and blake griffin stuff i wanted to ask you where do you guys think the buy do you think buyouts are ruining the competitive balance of the nba don't i want to start with you yeah i mean uh I feel like it's just like a way to just dump a player in some cases. And then it's also a way for the players to like strong arm the company or the org into just letting them go. I mean, I, I, I think that the Spurs, like LaMarcus has done so much for the Spurs that I don't think that they really mind letting him get bought out, but it's just like, you know, ideally you would want to make a trade for him. Uh, picks regardless of what those are players is something and I think buyouts are definitely changing the way we view the landscape of the NBA. Cause instead of saying like, Oh, like what are they going to have to give up now? It's just like, well, just buy them out. Right. Like what's the point. Um, but are, are we going to talk about some of the other trades that happened in the, um, the NBA or was, was that like my opportunity to, cause I, I mean, if you Vucevic... got other trades to talk about them by all means. Oh yeah. Uh, Vucevic to the bulls. Oh yeah. That, yeah. That I, was think moved. I think that's huge. Uh, yeah. The magic aren't a team anymore. The, uh, no, the Magic are not a team. They're a loose yeah. collection of individuals. They, yeah, they they are literally nothing at this point. I think Gonzaga could beat them at this point. Uh, oh, of course, oh. of course not. There's no way a college team could ever beat an NBA. No, but, let's just put but, that to bed right now. We're never yeah, going to yeah. debate that on the podcast. That <laughs> won't ever happen. That, that would never happen. But I do think that the Magic are... I was almost a little hopeful for like what they had become because I mean they hadn't really been anything for a they while. Were going to per- and- they were going to be a perennial six seed. It was going to be so yeah. fun. Yeah, and I, I think that I kind of feel for my boy Markel Fultz because I, I really liked him coming out of UW, so I'm, I'm a little sad for him. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that – and was the, the Victor Oladipo trade happened during the trade? Oh, run, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah to Miami. Went to heat, he went to the Heat, which I think is awesome for the Heat. I think the Heat are definitely, like – they're a sleeper team for sure. I mean, I say that, and they made the finals last year, so – you know, but I feel like picking up a player like Victor Oladipo is huge for them. So those are the those are the three things I saw. And then obviously the Nuggets are massive and are going to be hard to defend. But that's kind of what they've been doing, and they seem to lose every year in the conference play. So who knows? 
Yeah, I mean, just like you said, there was there was pretty good, you know, good key additions to other teams. It's just we didn't hear about it because it's all about Nets and Lakers right now. Yeah. So Drummond and Lamarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin going. We didn't hear about this. And yeah, there's pretty good moves. Like, I think the Nuggets uh, had a solid um, uh, b- uh, moves before the trade deadline. Like, who was it? They got Javel McGee, Aaron yeah. Gordon. Like, they're already a big team. Uh, so with Joker and, I mean, I think this team's gonna be again right in the race, like how they were against the Lakers before going to the finals. Um, the Clippers are now being that team that you don't really hear about. I mean, like you said, they got rid of Lou Williams and they got Rondo. But I, I don't know how I feel about the Clippers right now. Like, like I have no idea what they're doing right now. Like, at first, Paul George started doing pretty good in Kawhi, and then now it's like they're moving the team around a lot. So they're kind of going under the radar. But, yeah, I'm pretty excited that we got Andre Drummond because, I mean, you know, LeBron and AD is hurt, and we need that – at least just to get into the playoffs, especially with the 10 playing now. So if we can just get in, that'll be cool because I don't think home home court advantage really matters with COVID protocols and everything. So Andre Drummond, easily a 15 and 20 guy every night if you wanted to be. And I think he will be because there's no LeBron or AD right now. So he's literally going to have to help us out. I mean, our really only good scores. I mean, he's not really a good score. He's really under the the paint kind of guy in the paint kind of guy, but Dennis Schroeder and Kyle Kuzma are only scores right now. So I like the addition of Andre Drummond. Yeah. I think that the, well, first off, I think that the Oladipo trade, I think that's really good for the heat. Kind of like you guys are saying, but I think that the Rondo move, especially for the Clippers, I mean, like you think that playoff Rondo is going to let a three, one series leads the boy. I mean, like, yeah, Rondo's not going to do much for him in the regular season, but once playoff <clears throat> Rondo activates, I mean, that's an entire, that's your third pillar right there. That's a big three. Like Rondo's that special, just secret sauce there. You see, I was going to, I was going to touch up on that if you brought it up, but like, you think my question is, I mean, Rondo was with AD and LeBron who, you know, are two individuals that will accept criticism or anything that needs to be done because Rondo's been there before. Do you think, Rondo could do the same with Kawhi and Paul George who don't really like that. Like, that's my question. You think they can take a backseat and say, okay, I'll listen to you, Rondo. If they want to win a championship this year, they need to. (laughs) Because the people that do that, they got rid of. Like Montrez Harrell was saying, you guys are this, this, and that, and they bounced them. So Rondo's going to come in, and you know he's going to tell you everything straight up, and he doesn't take anything. And I wonder if they'll take that as a positive let's do a negative i I would have to think that they at least consulted Kawhi and paul george when they made that move because i mean they got rid of lou williams in that deal like you'd have to think that they at least had him in on that discussion so i would hope at least that they know who they're getting and why they're getting him and they're willing to make that sacrifice because let's be honest here it didn't work last year if they do the same thing again it's not gonna work this year my uh oh go ahead no you you go ahead uh i was gonna say my biggest concern for the clippers is Who's gonna talk in the locker room? Like, do you want to hear from like, like, you want to hear from, uh, do you want to hear from Paul George, who's just gonna be like, he, he, I mean, what is he gonna say in the playoffs? Like, I won't choke this game, I promise. Uh, or like, do you want to hear from Kawhi, who doesn't say a word? Lou Will was like the leader; he was the face of the Clippers for the longest time, and he's he's always been there. And I and I feel as though now that Lou Will is off the team, I'm not sure you want somebody like Patrick Bev or Rondo leading the locker room. So that's that's a big concern of mine. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the trade definitely, I think that you get a starter in return for a six man in the Hawks, but I don't know. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, and I think the Clippers are, I mean, what are they like? The fir- aren't they the first seed? Or no, they're, they're like the third seed. Like they're third, yeah. the Jazz and the uh, Suns, Suns, whatever. Yeah, the yeah. Suns, yeah. So I, I think that there's a lot that they could uh I think that they need a little bit of extra push and I'm not sure Rondo will give up to them. So. Yeah. Like I also feel like that that is not to bring that up. That is a weird locker room. Because Rondo just has one thing on his mind. It's like ring chasing right now. And then Kawhi is just like, I'm just here to play basketball. Like Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't talk to me. Like you're if you're on it. my team. Yeah, like if you're on my team, like like we're playing together and that's it. Don't talk to me. 
And then Paul George is like sensitive. So yeah. if you even say anything about him, he turns into like pandemic playoff P, which is like complete trash. So I don't know. It's it's a weird something weird going on there with the Clippers. Yeah. I, I think I do want to touch on the buyout thing. I think that it is absolutely like ruining the competitive balance of the league. Like I because I mean I think we kind of saw it with the Marcus Aldridge deal. I mean, like, okay, he's not gonna play for us and we're gonna work on finding a trade for him. Do you really think any single team worth anything called to trade for LaMarcus Aldridge? No, yeah. they were just going to wait out and let him get bought out and get him for like $800,000, I think is what he got from the Nets. Like the buyout market at this point allows you to stack a team with all-stars that don't want to be there in a small market team. Like how are you supposed to compete when your best player is ready to just walk and get signed for cheap, you know, elsewhere? Like if, if a player knows they're just going to get bought out, what's the point of a contract at that point? Yeah. Like there is no incentive. Like in some ways it makes me wonder why are there any trades at all? Like, unless like, you know, for sure that that player will still play for you by the deadline after it's over. Why does any team have any incentive to go trade for a guy? Just let him get bought out and sign him for a fraction of what he was making for his old team. Like, that's how these players get fit under the cap. I mean, they're being signed for, you know, minimums. Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. There should be no way in any sporting league worth its salt that LaMarcus Aldridge, Blake Griffin, and Andre Drummond should be playing for the minimum. Yeah. Like, that's just ridiculous. Like, I mean, I mean, I understand LaMarcus and Blake Griffin because they're not, they're past their primes. They're kind of just like that last veteran piece you need. Um, they're definitely not the player that they were before, but like players like Andre Drummond, I think he's like 26, 27. Like players like that should not be bought out. They're still in their prime. They're still worth something and could be traded for more value. So I, I don't understand. And there was like so many buyouts this year. It was just insane. It's, it's unheard of. Like, um, especially like through like 2000, 2020, there was literally like not, or you didn't even hear about any buyouts. And then in one year, there's just so many. So it kind of is ruining everything. And then already people get to decide where they want to go along with these bios. Now it's just ruined the competitive nature. Yeah. I think, I think they definitely, the league definitely needs more players kind of like, um, like Jimmy Butler in a sense, because I feel like he, he's always been, who was it? I think it was Carl Malone in an interview said like, I don't understand why all these players are just going ring chasing. Like I wanted to be the player to beat them. Like I, I, I wanted to beat the best team. I didn't want to be the best team kind of deal um and i feel like the only person who really represents that in the league is jimmy butler because i mean you take a team with like a bunch of players who like you can't even say after names at this point so i mean you know i, I feel like he's kind of taking that team to like another like echelon of play but yeah i, I feel like uh the league's kind of getting trashed on which is unfortunate. And that's, and that's tricky to say with jimmy butler because i mean he went to minnesota and then quickly just left to heat so yeah but that was more so because he was being too hard on people and they're kind of too soft. He went to Minnesota and found that Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins were not the type of players he wanted to yeah, play with. Yeah, they're just, they're just soft. Like, pretty much what he thought. And Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, now uh, moving on to uh, the beard. Um, he came out in an interview the other day and said that he felt like the MVP. So, guys... Is James Harden the MVP right now? I mean, Joel Embiid, of course, you know, was a front runner and he got taken out due to injury. LeBron James was probably in pole position for the MVP at that point, and of course, blew his ankle out, and now he's probably out of the running. So, is James Harden the MVP of the NBA this year? Uh, Don, I, I want to start. start. Oh, Eddie, okay, let's cool. go with you first. Yeah. No, I was about to say I don't even want to speak about James Harden. So, whoever wants to go for it, go for it. Yeah, I'll take a shot. Um, yeah, I had Embiid for the longest time because this was like the first season that he's been like healthy. And I was like, oh my God, he's averaging almost 30 points. Like he's insane. And then, you know, he did Embiid, Embiid things where you just get injured. So, um, my MVP, I guess, is I feel like my qualifications for MVP are not only personal stats, but also team success. And then looking at the players that you're surrounded by. So I think when you look at a team like the Nets, who are the second seed, um, and the players on there are completely stacked in every position. Uh, and then you take into account like someone like the Nuggets, who I have Jokic as my MVP candidate, because I feel like when you look at his team, the people that surround him, uh, yeah, granted, they're all awesome players, but most of them aren't all 
pro team all ours all-star kind of players like I feel like he definitely is the leading force in his team I think that if you look at if you look at the Nets without James Harden the Nets still make it to the to the finals if you look at the the Nuggets without Nikolai Jokic they'd probably lose yeah. in the first round so yeah. I mean granted they're probably going to do that anyways but they lose for sure in the first round so I think that uh, I think that Jokic is definitely my MVP. I mean, I think his stats are 27 points on the year with 8.5 assists averaging, which is pretty insane. Um, so yeah, best big man in the league. Julia, do you think that James Harden should even deserve consideration, considering how his tenure in Houston came to an end there, and the fact that he wasn't giving his 100 percent to force his way to the Nets? Mm, yeah, probably not. Um, I've never been a Rockets fan, so I've. I mean, I. I do, did never, never cared about James Harden. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that the end of his career in, in Houston kind of just says a lot, you know, kind of knocks you out of MV, MVP status, in my opinion. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have anything, like Eddie said, to say about him. I, I've never been a fan of his. So Ryan, Ryan's the guy and he's not here today. He'd have a lot to say. <laughs> he, he can't defend his guy. So, I mean, you oh, know, we're going to get our shots in while we can. I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've never been on his team super hard. So, I mean, I would say no. Yeah. I think me personally, the MVP means a lot, not just for, you know, what you do on the court, but what you can do in the locker room. And like, he was an absolute cancer to that Houston team by the end. And honestly, I think kind of burned them on the way down. Like, so I don't know if I consider him now, even if I were like, if I were just to throw out that eight game stretch with the Rockets, and say that never happened. His season really started with the Nets. Yeah, his stats probably say he's an MVP candidate, but look at who he's playing with, right? Like, you can't, like, say that, you know, that Kevin Durant and uh, Steph Curry with the Warriors were just constantly stabbing each each other and say James Harden's the MVP when he comes right back around with even better players, I think, surrounding him, like, as a whole. Outside of, mm, I don't know, the debate of which team would be better, Prime Warriors with KD or Prime Nets with KD, I think is a very interesting discussion to have. But we'll, t- we'll table that for next time, actually. But, like, I think that he's just playing with so many good people. I can't say that James Harden's my MVP, even throwing out the Houston tenure. I- I'm with you, Don. I think that Jokic probably is my MVP. I think you take Jokic off that team, there may be an eight seed. Yeah. But he makes that entire team just click. And he's got the stats to back it up. And he's been healthy. And he's not a locker room cancer. So I think you put all that stuff together. I think that Jokic is my MVP. However, if LeBron hadn't gotten hurt, it was probably LeBron for me. Like, he was having a year. And especially with the media narrative, he was kind of putting forth after last season when Giannis won it fairly, I might add. I thought that Giannis deserved that second one. But, like, especially this year, there was probably no denying LeBron until he got hurt. Yeah, I think it says a lot about somebody if they have to say that they should be the MVP. Yeah, true. And Yeah, true. And, like, again, like y'all were saying – I still think Jokic now that Embiid and LeBron, LeBron and, and Embiid were kind of the, the front runners. And now I think by far it's it's the Joker. Um, and if not, I think we see Giannis getting it again uh, yeah. because of the injuries. Um, and maybe Damian Litter could get some love. I mean, he's averaging 35 and 7 right now. So, Any, but, any Bradley Bill fans in here? Anybody? Anybody? He, but right. Bill got hurt. That's the issue. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, just just got hurt. He, he would yeah. be in my top five if he hadn't gotten hurt. But and not only that, not only that, people just the, the NBA or people around fans don't don't even like care about uh Bradley Beal. Just like Damian Lillard. I mean, wasn't this Bradley Beal's like first like All Star start? Like, yeah. This is his first All Star team, I think. Was his first All Star team? Like he was the perennial like this dude got snubbed. Like yeah, like yeah. snubbed every year. So, I mean, Joker. I mean, his numbers, 27, 12, and 8, is just insane. Like, yeah. he's, pr- he's pretty much like a better prime Mark Gasol, if you think about it. And I think he'll get it. Um, again, with James Harden, I just think that your MVP status starts from the beginning of the season and ends with the, the end result of it. So him going to another team just definitely defeats the purpose of him even being in the race. That's just my – that's just what I think. Fair enough. Uh, so we're going to move over to the NFL now. Uh, they added a 17th game to their season, of course, uh, just announced the other day, extended season from 16 games. Uh, in response, of course, to kind of compensate for that, they are cutting a preseason game. So, Julia, I want to start with you. Did we actually need a 17th game in the regular NFL? 
you know, the regular season? Um, I don't really think so. I think that, I mean, like for what, you know, like, like what's the reasoning behind adding another game? Yeah. Money? Money. Yeah. For sure. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they're doing pretty well for themselves. I don't know. I, I, I don't really think so. It's kind of like, like why? <laughs> Don, did we need a 17th game? Uh, no. Uh, I have a, I have a thing when I make, when I like see the, the bullet points of what we're going to be talking about, I kind of make a scratch note and sometimes I forget what I write down. And the only thing I have written here is nice players org. So um, that's basically <laughs> all I have to say about it. It's just like, that, like, I swear the NFL gets folded every year. Like they just never like, they, like there's just something with the player org that just like, they just can't figure it out. And it, it seems like, I remember last year they wanted to like shorten the season and now they're playing an extra game. So, you know, how do you take it? Eddie, let's go to you. I'm cool with it uh, selfishly because I mean, this means more football. So if I get an extra week of football, it's my favorite sport. I'm down for it. And number two, it could be because, you know, maybe one more game will give them a deciding factor for a playoff spot or to get bounced out of the playoff spot. And, uh, I'll tell you what, though, I bet you Jeff Fisher's pissed that if he, I mean, he probably wishes he can be in this because he can't go eight and eight anymore. <laughs> but, but, uh, I think it, I like it. I mean, I, I don't think I saw that a couple of players like Alvin Kamara, et cetera, other people were saying that maybe they deserve more money because of an extra game. But I think that's kind of ridiculous. They kind of make a good purse already. So, uh, I, I've been seeing a lot of players don't like it. But I don't see why not. I mean, it's just one extra game. I mean, they still get a bye week, so maybe they get two bye weeks. I don't know. That's, that's another discussion. Yeah, I, I just think it's a lot more damage on the body. That's it. I mean, just like every game is just like tough on these players, obviously. But uh, I did think I saw some tweet about it where it was like, finally, the NFC East can go positive. And exactly. I was like, that's not going to happen still. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm cool with it. Like Eddie said, cause football is awesome and I love watching it and, you know, having an extra week to get excited for and put on my jersey is awesome. But I mean, at the same time, it's like, I, I kind of feel for the players in a sense. Um, but yeah, uh, there's not much else to say about it. Yeah. I think that, I mean, kind of like Eddie's saying selfishly, I like the extra week of football. That means an extra week of Sunday ticket, et cetera. So like, I feel really good about that bit. I like that they at least cut a preseason game out. Like, on one hand, it kind of sucks for, like, the guys at the very back end of the 53-man roster that are probably going to be – because I'm assuming they're cutting, like, week four, so the timetable is going to move to, like, week two is going to be the big game now for all your starters to get in on and get warmed up, and week three is going to be your, like, last cut game. So, at least for those guys, it kind of sucks. But, I mean, like, four preseason games, I mean, like, the fourth one didn't really matter outside of those end-of-bench guys. So, I – I like that they're cutting it down. So at least it's the same amount of games. You're just going to see the starters for an extra game now. So I like that aspect of it. Kind of like you guys are saying though, like, did we really like, what was kind of accomplished by this? Like, it's just another game of football. I mean, at, at least bonus points wise, unless something crazy happens and Eddie, I'm sorry to kind of do this to you, but I could perfectly see the Vikings being the first team ever to finish a 17 game season, eight and eight with a tie. It just Damn. feels like something that they would do. I'm sorry. So like, <laughs> I, I don't know, but I mean, more than likely we aren't going to see many teams finishing at 500 anymore. I think that this helps the Titans. They can no longer finish nine and seven every year. Like there are some, there are at least going to be some changeups and some breaks, but like, I don't know. This just kind of feels like they're doing it for the money. Like, that's the big thing. They aren't – this isn't, like, going to drastically change, like, playoff things because you can still see ties for, you know, yeah. playoff seating. You really don't it's think so? It's just another game. I, I really don't. I don't see an extra game changing too much because the way I look at it, all you're really going to do with that then is you're going to see teams that would have finished, like, one game out of the postseason now have a shot to come back the next week and win that game and tie whatever team's above them in the standings. Like, all it does is just kind of move the goalposts back. Like, it, What if it's, like, a division game, though? Like uh, the last game deciding. Yeah, that's a good question. Is it division game or is it just what is it? Um, I believe what they, I I don't know the exact formula they use to add it on, but I know that they're cross conference, uh, and we got some juicy matchups. I think uh, Packers and Chiefs are playing in one uh, of them. 
I know the Cowboys are playing the Patriots. Like they, they kind of like stack the deck kind of to make some interesting matchups. Like they didn't get it across the board. I know that like uh, Philadelphia is playing the Jets. I think. I mean, like who's gonna want to watch that game next? But but I think either way, like even though they're playing AFC teams or non divisional teams, um, don't you think it still play a factor? Because like if you win, let's say Green Bay beats the Chiefs and we're playing. I forgot who we're playing. The Bills. Like, what if we're one game away and Packers lose, Vikings win? Like, does that? What did that give them? Like a spot? Yep that that is a fair point to make. Now, I do think that they're going to like kind of spread those games like throughout the season. It's not like we're just going to get this mythical Week 18 and all these new games are going to be played. Then, from what I know, they're kind of like divvying it up throughout the season, so not everybody's going to play that single game on that week. It's just going to kind of be like the usual NFL schedule kind of like mix. Like some teams are playing divisional foes. Some are, you know, conference, et cetera. It's just going to be mixed in there. To I, my just hope, I just hope it doesn't like mess up the playoff. Like, uh, yeah, like standings. Like I, I, I still want to see like those teams that are that say, uh, oh, the Bears can make it if um, Packers lose, Vikings lose, Lions lose. Like all oh, that. I still want to see that. Like I hope it doesn't mess that up. Yeah. I would say like the biggest thing. Especially like for me and you, Ryder, like the NFC West is like, like that that that's that's a super competitive um, conference. So I mean, I feel like one game can definitely decide a lot. So uh, I'm, I, I I'm not sure how much it will actually affect it. I would love to see if like we're all within one game coming down to Week 17, but I, I doubt that it will actually happen. But I think I do agree with Eddie that I've always liked seeing like the. The, the Bears fans who are like like at three in the morning being like, okay, if everyone loses except for them, then we could do it. Like, I, I love seeing those because they're exactly. just so funny. So. If exactly. Mitch Trubisky could actually throw a pass, we could actually win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. If he can actually throw a pass and the 49ers lose, the uh, Green Bay Packers lose, and the Cowboys lose. Like, if we there's can make a full it moon out, then. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If the yeah. ghost of Mike Dick, even though he's not dead, if the ghost of Mike Ditka returns. <laughs> See, this is why we need the the best like eight teams and not like the the division winners. You know what I'm saying? Like I know there is a talk about that. Like what if we what if they did it by the best record and not just negative winning divisional like? I, I mean that would get rid of the NFC East at least, so that might be a plus. But exactly, exactly. But that's another discussion. That'd be interesting. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move on to of course to our last like topic of the uh, podcast. Uh, the NFL released a statement, or at least Roger Goodell did, expressing optimism that they're expecting full stadiums to open this season. So, Eddie, how good of an idea is it to, like, be putting this out there and ex- saying you're expecting full stadiums? Uh, okay, so the reason I want to talk about this is because it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Um, and it's literally just, uh, one, we beat COVID or we didn't. So... By then, if we have full stadiums, um, I think this is Roger Goodell after the meeting, of course. I'm guessing this is thinking everybody's going to be vaccinated. And it's also a good question to think, hey, can you get a ticket or can you even get a seat if you're not vaccinated? So that's a question to think about, too. And it's too early. I know it's an idea, but I think I don't know to tell you if it's a good idea or not. I really can't touch on that because who's to say five months from now, the world's different. Um, you know, with the vaccines, we might see spikes go down, but it's too early to say. All I know is that I know for a fact they're going to make, um, you know, players, coaches, staff to get all vaccinated. So I would expect that they, you know, want the fans to do the same. Julia? Julia? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it also is like, you know, if you go to games, you you know that you're going to put yourself at risk, I guess, or potentially could be at risk. So it's kind of just up to the fans who attend. You know, you have to make that decision for yourself and for your family. And I think with vaccinations rolling out and becoming more accessible, there's the potential to fill a stadium. Um, but I, I think it, it kind of just depends on, on what the fans decide where you are in the world. I mean, I think the Texas stadiums will probably be a little bit more full than, uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere up North, but I mean, it, it just kind of depends. 
I think it is like Eddie said a little early to to really decide what's going to happen. But I mean, you, you really never know. I mean, we could have packed stadiums next next season, but I don't know. Yeah. Don. As a fan of the sport, I love to see it, and I can't wait. I'm super excited. But as a uh, as a, a, a citizen of the United States, um, it's a little hard to it's a little hard to root for. But I, I am I definitely want to do it. I mean, I think that it like Eddie was saying, if the protocols are right, then yeah, 100. percent I don't think that like I don't I believe that everyone who should get vaccinated, but like as in like in the the percentage of people who are going to die kind of deal with like autoimmune deficiencies. I think that once they get vaccinated, I think that having like giant football stadiums where like worst case scenario, you get sick obviously, but like, hopefully it's not like, it's more like you get sick for like a week kind of deal, you lose taste or whatever, but nothing that's going to put you on a respirator. Uh, then I think that it would be super cool. Uh, but I do know like one thing is that like obesity plays a huge factor in like the deaths with COVID and almost every football fan at Cowboy Stadium is like over like 60 pounds overweight. So I think that, you know, we might lose a lot of Cowboys fans, which is very unfortunate. Uh, Not really. Nah, hey, really. <laughs> but, but I wasn't yeah. going to say it, but uh, no, we love I Cowboys think- fans. Yeah, true. We love you. I, I love just I climbing thought. on you guys. It's, it's my favorite. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I root for it in terms of, cause I've always loved like, like there's something about being like, like an example of where like the, um, the Seattle Seahawks stadium. I mean, like, like you look at like how loud it gets in there. Like it caused an earthquake kind of deal. So, you know, it, it's pretty awesome. Uh, I definitely think the players are missing out on it. I think that if it does affect games a hundred percent. So I think that putting oh, yeah. them in a bubble system is kind of weird. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So I, I, I really want it to happen. But I think like the proper steps need to be taken for that mm-hmm. to happen. Otherwise, it's just going to end in terrible disaster. Yeah, yeah I just kind of like echoing all you guys are saying. As a sports fan, I want it to come back so bad. I mean, like you're just there's something missing from sports when the fans aren't there. But Don, especially like you're bringing it up, it needs to be done at the right time and it needs to be done safely. Because like if we just kind of go into this ad hoc and we're just going to open it up to open it up and like the trends aren't in our favor. I mean, yeah. that's just criminal, right? Like, you can't, like, every single NFL game would be a super spreader event in that case and would just lead to this drawing out even longer than it already right. has. So I'm completely with you guys. Want to see it back, but it needs to be done the right way and the, like, protocols need to be in place. And kind of like you guys are bringing up also, I mean, like, maybe, you know, require that they're all vaccinated, you know? Like, I don't know the legality of that. I don't know, like, what they, I'm pretty sure they could enforce that. But... I feel like that's something that would almost need to be a prerequisite yeah. in order to be able to conduct it safely. Mm-hmm. I don't know how popular that would be in certain parts of the country, but I mean, True. football's also I mean, pretty popular. So, yeah, I mean, it's still like almost about half a year away. So, I mean, maybe Roger Goodell knows something that we don't like, maybe, you know, he's going to beat 19 and he's ready for 20. So we'll see. Yeah. True. I, uh, I got faith in the league. I yeah, faith. same. I mean, they did good. They gave us a full season and a Super Bowl. Yeah. So I don't doubt that they can do it again. All right. Well, that's all the topics we have for this episode of Flipping the Bird. I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to us. And we will see you all next week. Have a good one.